Hi, everyone. Welcome to our presentation. Today, we're going to discuss factors associated with college students' mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Krista Soria, and I use she, her pronouns. And my name is Bonnie Hargos, and I use she, her pronouns. And we both work at the University of Minnesota. I wanted to begin by offering a land acknowledgement. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of Indigenous people. The university resides on Dakota land ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. We recognize that every member of the university community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land um, since the institution's founding. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native folks. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous sovereignty, and we will work to hold the University of Minnesota more accountable to the needs of American Indian and Indigenous peoples. I wanted to begin by offering a very brief overview of the Seru Consortium. Although given our audience, many of you are probably familiar with this information. The Seru Consortium is a group of top tier research intensive universities and we collaborate by administering Seru and grad Seru surveys, by sharing Seru benchmark data and best practices with each other, and also collaboratively seeking paths for institutional self-improvement and collaboration. The Seru Consortium is comprised of members from across the United States, but we also have schools that participate internationally as well. And in COVID-19 times, um, back in 2020, we rapidly developed a survey to measure students' COVID-19 experiences. The survey had a number of goals. Um, one was we wanted a survey in which we could collect data that would be actionable. Additionally, we wanted a relatively short survey, which as you all know is, is a bit of a challenge for folks who participate in the Seru Consortium. We also desired to have a survey that was mobile friendly, cost effective, and allowed institutions to benchmark against each other as well. In this particular study, we analyzed data from eight large public research universities who participated in the COVID-19 survey from May to July of 2020. The response rates between the institutions ranged between 13% to 24%, and our final sample was around 27,000 students. We also have data, of course, from over 17,000 graduate and professional students who also administered the survey at the same time. We do have our full sample information posted, and so I won't go into a lot of details other than to share that we tend to have more cisgender women who complete our survey um, than we typically might see in our school's population. Um, our sample is relatively diverse and is often pretty representative of the samples of the other institutions regard, um, with regards to race and ethnicity. We had about a quarter of our students who are first generation low income or working class, and we also collected data on students who were caregivers during the pandemic as well. The conceptual framework that we used for this study was Fink's 2014 Integrated Model of College Students' Mental Health. And Fink wrote essentially that there are interpersonal factors, there are institutional factors and individual factors that are associated with college students' mental health. In this study, we added our own factors. We included academic and financial stressors, which of course were highly relevant during the pandemic. And we also included data about students' health and safety as well. We should note that we have published the results of this study in the Journal of College Student Development, and it appeared in one of the most recent issues as a research in brief in that particular journal. We'd be happy to pass along a copy of that article for anybody who might be interested in receiving it. In terms of our methodology, broadly speaking, we used effect coding for all of our variables, and we used multivariate logistic regression to predict the odds of students having clinically significant major depressive disorder and clinically significant generalized anxiety disorder. Across our sample, about 35% of our students met that criteria for having clinically significant symptoms for major depressive disorder. And we measured that using the PHQ-2 and more information about that instrument is available on this slide. Additionally, in our sample, about 39% of students met the criteria for having clinically significant generalized anxiety disorder symptoms as well. And again, those, that information is available on this slide. We use the GAD2 to capture this information. Both the PHQ2 and the GAD2 are also featured in 
uh, the 2021 CERU and grad CERU surveys, which we hope will yield a lot of really useful information for, for institutions. We used uh, just about every demographic variable that we included in the survey, including students' gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, citizenship, disability, uh, their parents' education. So we created a first generation variable there, um, social class, and then of course their caregiving status as well. For the interpersonal variables, we asked students whether they felt like they belonged at their university and whether they felt valued as an individual at their university. For the institutional variable, we included whether students felt supported by their universities during the pandemic. For the health and safety variables, we also included our two item screener for food insecurity and then our two item screener for housing insecurity. And then we, we also included a number of items related to student safety in terms of um, their current residence, which of course for many students meant um, sometimes living off campus and then relocating to their home environment. So we included those four questions at the bottom. We had a lot of financial hardship related questions. And so we included those in our survey as well. Um, notably, um, some of the most frequently experienced financial hardships are related to the loss or reduction of income from other family members and the loss or cancellation of expected jobs or um, unexpected increases in living expenses. So over a third of students in our sample experienced um, those three financial hardships. We also included all of the academic obstacles that we assessed in our survey as well. Um, and these, as you can see, um, tended to have sometimes a higher response than the financial hardships. So for instance, the lack of motivation for online learning, the lack of interaction or communication with other classmates, both of those had um, a really good percentage of our students, over two thirds of our students reported experiencing those academic obstacles when they transitioned to remote instruction. So the results of our analysis for generalized anxiety disorder. On the left-hand side of the screen, here we present um, variables that are associated with increased odds of experiencing these clinically significant symptoms. And then on the right, we have the decreased odds. So for instance, we can see factors like sexual orientation sometimes tend to um, be associated with increased odds of GAD. Um, for instance, uh, pansexual students, queer students, students who preferred not to describe their sexual orientation all had significantly higher odds of experiencing generalized anxiety disorder compared to their peers. Additionally, domestic students compared to international students, transfer students, white students, those who cared for adults, those who had neurodevelopmental or cognitive disabilities, those who experienced both food and housing insecurity also had significantly higher rates of generalized anxiety disorder. And then on the right hand side, those are the variables associated with the decreased odds. So here we can see that cisgender men compared to their peers had a, a decreased odds of experiencing GAD, as did straight students. International students and non-transfer students also had lower odds. And additionally, when students were more likely to feel like they belonged at their universities, when they felt a better um, sense of, of being valued at their institutions, that was also associated with decreased odds of anxiety. Students who were more likely to say that they had a place to live where they felt safe and protected or had a place to live that was free from physical and emotional abuse also had decreased odds of GAD as well. And all of these factors are associated with increased odds. So these range from um, financial factors, so increased um, it, it, unexpected increases in spending for technology, loss of jobs, loss of wages from family members, but also some academic obstacles as well. So experiencing the lack of clear expectation from instructors, lack of access to advising, um, lack of access to learning support services, all of these factors on the screen um, when the more students, you know, the students who experience these things actually had increased odds of experiencing those clinically significant symptoms for generalized anxiety disorder. When it comes to major depressive disorder, similarly on the, on the left, we see the increased odds and on the right, we see the variables associated with decreased odds. So on the left, um, students who are actually from lower social class backgrounds were more likely to experience those increased odds of major depressive disorder. And again, sexual orientation, um, queer, asexual, and students who prefer not to describe their sexual orientation had increased odds 
uh, Asian students, caregivers, students with a neurodevelopmental or cognitive disability or two or more disabilities, and those experiencing food and housing insecurity also had clinically significant increases. Uh, also, it had increases in the odds of experiencing clinically significant symptoms for major depressive disorder. And then on the right is where we can see those factors that are associated with decreased odds. So cisgender men compared to their peers had lower odds of, of major depressive disorder as did straight students. And again, you know, feeling belonging, feeling valued by their institutions, feeling supported by their institutions, and having a safe place to live was also associated with decreased odds in major depressive disorder. And um, as for generalized anxiety disorder, we also see that financial and academic factors were associated with increased odds. So students who had unexpected increases in spending, those who lost jobs or had reduced wages from family members, um, those who experienced academic obstacles like the lack of clear expectations, lack of access to academic advising, lack of access to an appropriate study space, all of those students also had increased odds of clinically significant symptoms. And I'll turn it over to Bonnie to reflect on some of the recommendations that we have moving forward. Thank you, Krista. Um, we just wanted to touch a bit on how we can help to improve student safety and mental health um, in higher education. First of all, we recommend allocating more resources and expanding mental health services, including um, modalities such as telecounseling, group counseling, and counseling and support apps. Um, as you know, when the uh, pandemic hit and everything shut down, we had to really scramble in terms of implementing mental health services for students. And fortunately, there's been a ton of innovation in the past year in terms of how we can offer services and um, ensuring that students are getting their needs met and increasing access to those is really important. Um, we also really recommend um, upping communication efforts as much as possible with students. You know, the data shows that the students who are most likely to be experiencing um, mental health concerns, uh, specifically LGBTQ students, students who um, are, are BIPOC, um, are also less likely to act to access mental health services for a variety of reasons. But if we can really be proactive in ensuring that students feel as though they have access to these resources and um, that they feel safe using them, that's really um, of utmost importance when addressing students' mental health needs. Um, also really focusing on prevention. And this really goes to um, ensuring that students feel safe, um, making sure that students have access to basic things such as food, housing, um, things along those lines. Obviously students' needs can't be met in terms of mental health if their basic needs aren't being met. So um, campuses can partner with various organizations in the community offer resources such as like grab and go food options and really just making sure that students needs are being met on a basic level. We also wanna um, really emphasize the fact that mental health is everyone's responsibility. And that means really engaging with faculty and staff. That's another way to ensure that students who are less likely to reach out to resources, maybe um, feel more encouraged to do so. Um, and that also goes to just sharing wellness information. We think that embedding um, wellness information in modules can be really effective, whether it is mental health concerns or access to ways that students can um, get exercise in the community or get their food and housing needs met. A really comprehensive holistic approach is really important and really faculty and staff can really help with that. Also sharing more information with frontline stakeholders pertaining to mental health, what to look for, how to support students. Um, and then finally, you know, offering alternative housing for students in unsafe environments or crisis situations. You know, like I said, students can't really meet um, other needs such as mental health or and really academic needs if they don't feel safe, if they don't feel cared for. So really partnering with organizations in the community to ensure that those resources are available and that we can really support students um, in a, in a well-rounded approach. So um, Krista, if you'd like to advance to the next slide, I believe we have 
any questions. <laughs> and then finally, we wanted to just go over really quickly that we do have um, a, a ton of different policy briefs um, relating to our data from 2020. First generation students' experiences during the pandemic, financial hardships, food insecurity, international students, mental health, and many, many more. We encourage you to go to the link here on the screen. Um, and for any questions, feel free to reach out to Krista or you can always tweet us. We love engaging with folks on Twitter. Krista, is there anything you wanna add before we wrap up? No, just a, a quick um, you know, offer that we're happy to address any questions and we're also happy to share um, that particular journal publication if you're interested in reviewing it in a little bit more detail as well. We only had a really short period of time in which to deliver this presentation today. And so, uh, you know, we're happy to follow through with um, providing some more information in addition to access to the journal article if you'd like some more information. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you.